Welcome to the second Bartlett School of uh, Planning Public Lecture for the academic year 2017-18. My name is John Tomley and I'm Professor of Urban and Regional Planning here at UCL. Uh, and I'll chair this evening's event. Uh, as I always say, our public lectures are intended to bring uh, leading international scholars and practitioners on planning in the built environment before an audience of colleagues, students and guests. So those of you who haven't been before, please look at our uh, website for details of the program. In January, we welcome Josh Ryan Collins, author of Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing. In February, we welcome Ali Madanipur of Newcastle University, uh, who will be talking about his latest book on urban design in a city. And the series culminates next May with the Sir Peter Hall annual lecture named for our late colleague, which this year will be given by our own Professor Fulong Wu. So as I say, please look out for further details. Uh, it's our custom on these occasions to invite you to join us for drinks after the lecture. Uh, so please do join us. Uh, we will be in the North Cloisters uh, for, the, for drinks. So there'll be food and wine available there. Let me now introduce uh, our speaker for this evening. Um, Fiona McCandless was appointed uh, Chief Planner of Northern Ireland in 2014. Um, and is responsible for advancing strategic planning, policy and development, policy development and legislation uh, in, in Northern Ireland. So she provides advice and support to the Minister for Infrastructure and the Northern Ireland Assembly on all planning related matters and manages regionally significant planning applications. These are all uh, elements of the devolved planning system in Northern Ireland, which I'm sure she'll talk about uh, in a moment. She oversaw the, the major reform of the planning system uh, which took place in 2015, which saw the uh, transfer of the majority of planning responsibilities from central to local government. So this was the first time that a local planning system had been really established in Northern Ireland. Prior to that, uh, Fiona was Director of Local Planning, uh, of the Local Planning Division in the Department of Environment. And there she was responsible for overall leadership and delivery of planning fu functions within, within all local planning offices across Northern Ireland when planning was a function of the uh, assembly and executive. Um, before that, before joining the Northern Ireland Civil Service in 1998, Fiona worked in a number of local planning posts in the Irish Republic, including in Dublin, Donegal and Roscommon. As Deputy Secretary in the Department for Infrastructure, Fiona also had responsibility uh, for a range of other functions, such as um, infrastructure, water drainage, and so on. She's a graduate of Queen's University, Belfast, and both a member and a sometime chair of the Royal Town Planning Institute's Northern Ireland branch. So Northern Ireland's never out of the news, of course, but given the current intersection of developments concerning devolution, or the absence of it at the moment, um, Brexit and the border question, and I suppose the general rediscovery of spatial planning by the UK government, uh, we thought we should raise our gaze beyond the M25 for once uh, and consider what is happening in the other parts of these islands, um, which I think is probably the best way to describe the relationship between Britain, Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic in the current climate. So I'd like... Uh, to thank Fiona for making the trip uh, from Northern Ireland here today and say welcome to UCL and the Bartlett School of Planning and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you John. Um, I have to say I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, despite how cold it is in London, it's actually warmer in Northern Ireland which is quite unusual but it's really nice to be here tonight and thanks John for the invitation. And in your introductory comments, John mentioned that I usually provide advice and guidance to the Northern Ireland Executive and to the Minister for Infrastructure. That's not strictly speaking true at the moment because obviously we're having a bit of political uncertainty in Northern Ireland, which is unfortunate, and we hope that that's rectified soon. But at the moment, we don't have a Minister for Infrastructure, so we're left in a much more uncomfortable position where we don't, where we work for ministers and we don't have uh, ministers in place at the moment. So hopefully come the new year and things will change. But I suppose it's one of the things that I would like to stress about planning, is that planning is a really political activity. And I think some people don't grasp the importance of trying to understand political dimensions that we work within. But it is, it's a very, very important element 
um, of the activity that we're involved in. So when John asked me to come and talk tonight, he asked me what I would like to talk about and not having much time to think of a topic, I thought I'd come up with something quite general. So I thought I'd think of where we are in Northern Ireland in terms of planning and that would cover just about anything. So, <laughs> but I'm assuming that not many people have a great awareness of the planning system in Northern Ireland. So what I thought I'd talk about is a bit about where we were in planning in Northern Ireland for the past few decades, the changes that we've gone through in the past few years and where we are now. And when we look at where we are now, kind of reflect on what the challenges are ahead of us and the types of things that we tried to achieve through the reform process because we went, underwent a huge reform of the planning system in Northern Ireland over recent years. I'd also want to talk just a bit about central government's role in planning and how planning plays a role in delivering for the government. And the restructuring that has taken place, not only in the delivering of planning functions, but also in the structural organisation of uh, central government. And Throughout all of that, I suppose I would like to try and stress some of the, the skills that I think that you need as a planner, because whenever I was sitting as a student in Queens many, many years ago, uh, I really don't think that planning had the complexities that uh, it gives rise to now and the expectations and the type of skills that are necessary. You will all work in very fast changing environments and you'll all need to have the ability and the resilience to adapt to that level of change. You'll need to have excellent communication skills and be really able to influence people and negotiate with people and try and persuade policy makers and decision makers. Um, so it's really important that you develop that really broad range of skills and really it's an awful lot of it also is about understanding the strategic, but really understanding detail as well. So you have to try uh, and manage both. And as I say, I think underlying all of that is understanding the political context that we work within. So maybe I'll just start off by saying something about reform and the reform of the planning system. Planning in Northern Ireland has been delivered in the same way for about 40 years. Um, as a result of the political tensions in Northern Ireland, central government took planning functions away from local government in the early 1970s. And so whilst the planning legislation might be quite similar to England, Scotland and Wales, the way it was delivered in Northern Ireland was completely different. So planning across most of the other jurisdictions was delivered by local government, but in Northern Ireland it was delivered by central government. And I suppose there were some benefits to that but there was a real understanding that that gave rise to a lack of uh, democratic accountability and a democratic deficit. And it also meant that decision making was here and the people affected by decisions was here. And we needed to try and find some way to make that much better connection and have much more informed decisions <laughs> by the communities that were impacted upon those decisions. So back in about having planning powers taken off local government to central government in the early 70s, it wasn't until 2007 that there was a political decision that there were maybe, there was, a there was a stability in the peace process and there was also a confidence in the political institutions that planning powers could revert back to local government again. So in 2007, Arlene Foster, who was the then Minister for the Environment, took the decision that she would totally reform the planning system, but also transfer powers back to local government. And it took over seven years for that transition to take place. Uh, and I suppose my job at the time was to manage that change programme. And that was as much about trying to reform and inform a new planning system, but it was also about trying to get people to work together and try and get people to adapt to change and move within organisations. And I suppose I'd have to say I was really, really impressed uh, at such a major reform programme. We not only reformed the planning system, we transferred the functions to local government and we reformed local government at the same time, 
all on the 1st of April, which was not lost in anybody, that it was April's Fool's Day that it took place. But we had 26 councils in Northern Ireland at that stage, and we reduced it to 11. So all of that took place at the same time. And it was a real challenge, I have to say, but I was really impressed by the skills of the planners that adapted to that level of legislative and structural change all at one stage. And one of the challenges that we had was trying to get local government and elected members who had never been involved in the planning process to try and develop their capability and capacity so that they could reach planning decisions and take that in a formed, informed and legally robust way. We brought in 25 new pieces of legislation in that year. We introduced the Planning Act. We transferred 400 staff from central government over to local government. We introduced new IT systems. We did the whole raft of a huge change program and we developed the capability and capacity of local government officials and elected members to try and take planning decisions. So the new councils now established since 2015 have the vast majority of planning responsibilities. So everything that's sat within local government before, and central government before has now transferred. So processing planning applications, delivering development plans, looking at strategic planning and enforcement. And that really addresses that gap and the connections between decision makers and the communities that are affected by those decisions. And it allowed local government really to put place shaping at the heart of their agenda and give them a really powerful tool in order to shape their area. So central government still has responsibility for setting the policy and the legislation at a strategic level and an oversight role of local councils, which we struggle with at the moment, um, to try and understand where that balance is, having transferred power, we still have a responsibility to make sure that it operates effectively. Uh, and my part of my job is, as Chief Planner in Northern Ireland is to make sure that the system is operating effectively. So we're two years on now, since, or over two years since we transferred the power. And one of the key objectives of that reform programme was really about improving the economy for Northern Ireland. It was set within that context. But after the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, there had been a real period of political stability and huge growth in Northern Ireland that it hadn't experienced throughout the 80s and 90s. And so in 2007, it was really about building that momentum, improving the economy and protecting the environment. There was much more of a focus also that was increasing in terms of health and well-being and the influence of planning on your environment and shaping health and well-being. And so many of those kind of priorities that it was set against the backdrop for were seen as competing um, and we were trying to get them to a place where they were much more complementary, where growing the economy um, and protecting the environment were one and the same thing. It was good for the economy if, the, if we were protecting the environment. And it took quite a while to get the politics of all of that working because we needed elected members who had never been involved in those types of decisions and competing interests trying to take those decisions. But we also were trying to really engage communities in a different way and to improve the planning system by allowing communities to engage in a much more positive way. And that was also one of the things that we felt the democratic deficit gave rise to that local communities weren't able to influence um, their areas. So in many ways, I think the, the new two-tier system that we have now, it's very early days. We're still you know, assessing the success of that. But I suppose as a project in terms of how central government and local government work, it was hugely successful. And it allowed people, it opened people's minds and their imagination as to what local government could achieve for their areas. The same community engagement, whilst we reformed the whole system, one of the key focuses was about trying to improve the quality of decisions and trying to, which in turn would improve the quality of people's environment and lives. And part of that was about engaging the community. The community engaged in planning in a really negative way, or in, not that it was really negative, it just could have been much more constructive. It was all about objecting to planning applications or objecting to a development plan but not in any proactive way. 
So what we tried to do was introduce a system where communities were engaged in the very early stages of the process rather than at the end and rather when a, uh, an application or a development proposal had been well developed. We wanted the communities to be able to influence it at the early stages. So we introduced mandatory requirement for uh, applicants to engage with communities for major applications. We ensured that all of the planning applications were front-loaded so that the frustrations that people experienced in engaging in the planning process were largely dismissed because it was the communities that were getting involved in the earliest stages. And whilst many of you might be very familiar with that and think, well, that's a great idea, this was such a sea change in Northern Ireland because local politicians had never been involved in planning decisions before. They had been consulted on them, but they had no role to play in the decision-making process. One of the other objectives that we sought during reform was to really change fundamentally the way we delivered our development plans. Um, again, that was a really tedious, cumbersome process that we had and we wanted to try and engage communities and we couldn't get them to engage because the process was too lengthy. And it was too frustrating for them and it was all about objections rather than coming up with good ideas. So we introduced new measures to allow for a much greater level of community participation and for people to be able to influence their areas. And I have to say all of the 11 councils that we have in Northern Ireland are really running with that. Um, there, there's a statutory link between the development plan and the local community plan. And the local councils have brought together all of their powers to try and combine that. And really make it work to shape and improve their area. The old development plan system was very long, very cumbersome um, and really inflexible and difficult to amend. So we have introduced a new two-stage process where we look at the strategic objectives under one process with an independent examination that follows that. And then we move on to local plan policies and we allow for an independent examination in that. And we look at the soundness of a plan rather than looking at specific objectives or objections to a plan. We look at it in the round in terms of whether this plan meets the needs of sustainable communities for this area. Um, and it's much more rounded approach to plan making. We've moved away from an narrow land use focus, much more towards a place shape and approach. And hoping that the councils really grab that unique opportunity to incorporate planning, community planning with all of their other functions like economic regeneration, tourism, etc. I suppose planning in the broadest sense really plays a central role in creating those environments that enhance people's health and well-being. Um, we're using the plan system to try and do that, to try and help develop more integrated strategies for healthy placemaking gather greater intelligence in terms of social and economic uh, determinants for urban health and to guide decisions and investment and involve a much greater range of professions and communities in informing how we promote healthy cities. And our new local development plan and community plan, I suppose we feel are the ideal platform to research and develop that and to bring forward those localised placemaking strategies and harness that holistic approach to improve in the environment, growing the economy, improving wealth and well-being. Well -being. And I think that the planning system is a really, really positive role to play in relation to that. Some other work that we're doing in line, I suppose, with our development plans is looking at how we integrate in a much improved way infrastructure provision and transportation. And Unlike London and my experience of travelling here and even walking here tonight, Northern Ireland is a really a very largely rural society. Um, it's quite low density and it's very dependent on uh, cars. And we need to really try and make the best use of the space in the cities that we have at the moment, but absolutely change the focus away from the reliance on cars and a much better integration of land use and transportation. So across Northern Ireland, we're doing development plans for the whole area at the moment, but we're also looking at transportation plans. And we're trying to ensure that we maximise that public transport, active travel, walking and cycling, and ensure that we have well-connected and inclusive spaces and communities. And that's a great opportunity for us because 
to do all of your transport plans, all of your development plans at the one time across the entirety of the province should be a really great achievement and should put us in a much stronger position. We're also working on a regional infrastructure delivery plan. We have a regional development strategy at the moment, but it was more effective when we had a unitary planning system, but now in a two-tier planning system, we're trying to improve our approach to regional planning and also link it more to um, infrastructure delivery. So an awful lot of issues that we had and, and elsewhere it was experienced as well in terms of regional planning was the lack of uh, connection to delivery. Um, so we're trying to link uh, our regional infrastructure with the delivery of um, key infrastructures, transport, energy, telecommunications, water and waste. And these are really long term development proposals. We're looking to towards 2050 and the future needs of the population and the economy towards 2050. So it's one of the challenges that we have. Our uh, politicians work within very short time frames and in order to engage politicians in long term investment decisions, you need to have something that they will really buy into. So we, rather than looking at a five year programme, we need them to look at uh, much broader and long term proposals. And all of this, there's quite a lot of work going on in strategic planning, particularly in Northern Ireland and in the South of Ireland at the moment. Um, the South of Ireland has just published, uh, well, it hasn't just published, it's just finalised its consultation on their national planning framework, Ireland 2040. And there's quite a lot of uh, synergies between what's going on in terms of infrastructure delivery in the North of Ireland and in the South of Ireland. And uh, we're trying to capture that. And that, so those kind of areas of works in community engagement development plan, how we engage in the communities in the planning process, and what we're doing in terms of uh, integration of transportation and regional planning. They're kind of quite a large focus of the work that we do at the moment. I suppose the other area of work that we're really engaged in as well is in relation to what we would call environmental governance and environmental compliance. Within planning policy and legislation, there's a huge amount of complexity around European legislation and the implementation of the European legislation. And it is open to quite a lot of challenge. And in Northern Ireland, it's quite litigious and we have quite a number of judicial reviews that are running at the moment. So we um, put a huge effort into trying to make sure that we fully comply with best practice and keep up to date and really focus on our ability to deliver, whether it's habitat assessments, EIA regulations, um, you know, whatever it is in terms of our EU responsibilities and environmental governance. And regardless, I think, of what happens with Brexit, um, we'll still always want to maintain, at the very minimum, the level of standard environmental protection that we have at the moment. So that environmental governance is another piece of uh, work that we, we focus quite strongly on. And we have, um, we're working with a number of people to try and ensure that we keep up to speed with that. But we also have a role then and a responsibility to make sure that local government um, are, have proper guidance and advice to make sure that they are also doing the same. So those are the kind of key areas of work that the department is involved in at the moment. I just wanted to also touch on the the structural changes that have gone on within departments in Northern Ireland. We have not only restructured local government, but we've also done quite extensive restructuring in central government, where we have gone from 12 departments down to nine departments. And planning originally would have sat within the Department of Environment, and now sits within the Department of Infrastructure. And I think that says something about where our politicians think uh, the focus of planning should be. Um, and, and not that it's less more about protecting the environment, but it's equally important about connecting people and opportunities through infrastructure. Um, and that has allowed us, I think, to work in a much closer way with transportation and in terms of infrastructure delivery, whether that's roads or water. I also happen to be responsible for water and drainage policy. And it's really, really important that we have an adequate water and wastewater infrastructure 
in place that complies with all of our legislation and will also meet the needs because if um, clearly we will have a huge constraint in economic growth if we don't do that. But the re departmental restructuring has allowed us to look at government in a better way, in a more agile way, and it's more joined up. And we are doing a lot of work on a new programme for government. And the programme for government at the out and draft stage at the moment is about looking much more at about outcomes that we want to achieve. So the draft programme for government that the Northern Ireland Executive had agreed on before the political difficulties that we experienced earlier this year, we're still continuing to work on that. And planning has a really important role to play in a number of uh, those areas, whether it's um, contribution to a strong, competitive, regionally balanced economy, protection of the environment, a healthier and more equal society, and a society where people are connected through infrastructure. So those are the type of broad outcomes that people that our executive have challenged us to see how government can work in a different way. And whilst planning isn't, or the built environment professionals aren't singled out in any of those outcomes, they broadly contribute to all of them. But one of the focuses of the new outcomes-based approach to the programme for government is how we work together. And um, previously, uh, and I'd say it's you know, common in most jurisdictions, governmental departments and local government as well tend to work very much in their own particular area, in their own silo. And uh, we have really tried to break that down and work much more collaboratively, working with our stakeholders, local gov central government is under extreme financial pressure at the moment. We will never be able to deliver what we used to by ourselves. So we need to work really, really closely with all of our stakeholders and come up with much more imaginative ways to deliver the services. And a lot of that is about changing the culture and the way people work. And that's not something that is easy to do, but it's something that we will need to work hard at. Um, Underlying all of our legislation and our strategic approach to policy, it's about sustainable development. And that's really at the heart of the planning system in Northern Ireland and how we manage growth and how we do that in a sustainable way. And there's a really strong interrelationship between how we deliver housing, jobs, services, infrastructure, all with an underlying theme of how we do that um, delivering sustainably. And I suppose planning, the role that planners can play in that is about bringing all of that together. Uh, I've tried to give you a bit of an overview of kind of the key, where the issues that we faced in planning in Northern Ireland and the types of things that we've tried to address and tried to come through. I think that there's still um, a lot of challenges that we face. We have a lot of uh, political uncertainty um, at home. We have um, a peace process at home, which has been really stabilized for many years, but uh, there's obviously a fragility to that, and we need to make sure that we support the economy and we continue to grow so that we don't, and we don't revert back to the more challenging situations that we had and that I certainly experienced when I was younger. Um, but we have other challenges that are, you know, similar across all of the jurisdictions. That relationship between central and local government um, is one that we, we all need to work towards because in a new system, 40 years of planning being delivered by central government and two years being delivered by a completely new range of people is a real challenge and we need to make sure that we get that right and we continue to build on that relationship. Um, we have similar issues. Okay. Um, in terms of the issues that are experienced here and the rest of these islands, an ageing population is a big issue for us, and particularly in some of the rural areas in Northern Ireland. It creates new demand for more flexible and varied housing and our transportation solutions. There's real changes in technology and the way people work affects our homes and our lives and affects our cities, um, and also affects our transportation. And we need to explore how we manage all of that. 
We need to look at ways that we develop secure supply of energy and we need to deal with contentious issues about waste. So there's some big strategic issues and the type of planning applications that I'm involved in that central governments deal, still deal with are the regionally significant applications. So things like um, the North-South Electricity Connector, that would be one of the types of applications that we would deal with or very large incinerator proposals or applications that usually are, are quite contentious. Um, I mentioned, you know, Northern Ireland has that history of divided communities and we continue and planning plays an important role in trying to build those more inclusive communities um, and a drive towards a more united and shared future for everyone. And that's a challenge we, we just continue to work on. We still have some physical barriers. Um, let alone psychological barriers that we need to try and break down. And John, you mentioned Brexit earlier. I suppose um, I'll be one of the only people in this room, I'd imagine, that lives one field away from the border with, with the south of Ireland. So my home will be in, uh, I don't, will not be in Europe, and my, um, the field towards the back of my house will be in Europe. So <laughs> there's, uh, it's a really strange dimension. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainties about Brexit, but Brexit in Northern Ireland will have a really, really significant impact um, on the people. It'll be a real reality. If I wanted to go from my house to buy a pint of milk, I would be as likely to go over the border as I would be to stay within Northern Ireland. I certainly would go across the border to buy petrol. But, <laughs> but so, and I suppose, Nobody wants to return to what we had in Northern Ireland previously, where we did have a hard border. Um, and, uh, you know, I think politically there's a real will to make sure that that doesn't happen. But there's serious consequences for us in terms of how it works. There's 310 miles of a shared border, I think, between the north and the south, and many tens of thousands cross the border every day to work or to study. And that will have a huge impact. Whatever happens at the border has the potential to have a big impact. And it will have a big impact in how we plan for our infrastructure. Um, there's other issues such as our environmental regulations and building standards, access to skilled workers, our funding. Um, an awful lot of the regulatory environment that we work in will be impacted by Brexit. And uh, we're going through an awful lot of the legislative um, requirements now to make sure that we're in a position for the first day um, that we have legislation in place that will allow us to continue to operate. Um, but I think Brexit, you know, your guess is as good as mine and some of the things that will happen to us. The way I look at it at the moment is it's an opportunity for us to try and develop really consolidate relationships that we have across these islands to make sure that we work cooperatively, that we manage as best situation, that we share best practice, that we're well informed and we cooperate in that kind of ever-changing external environment. But I think planners are good at doing that. I think that's the type of thing that planners do. They adapt to change and you need to be able to work within that changing environment. Um, I suppose just to conclude, I don't know whether on time, whether that's right or not, but um, I think for all of us that are involved in the built environment, and particularly in Northern Ireland at the minute, given the changes that we've experienced, we have a real opportunity to make positive change. Um, I think what's going on in the programme for government and the new outcomes-based approach to that the work that's going on across local government in relation to their development plans and the emerging work that we are doing in terms of infrastructure planning at a regional level all offer good opportunities to align and help us drive the future economy for the North. Um, a key challenge is to how we build in the relationships and how we collaborate and recognising that we have a lot of different interests but we have an underlying shared commitment to make um, Northern Ireland a better place. I think for students or those involved um, in education, there's a real need to continually adapt to the skills that we need. The skills, as I mentioned earlier, the skills that I um, learned 
whenever I was at university, I think are quite different to the skills that are necessary, necessary now. Um, I think leadership is a really important skill as a planner. You need to be really able to lead, manage change, bring people with you. You need those personal qualities and you need a level of resilience because you are often trying to persuade people that have a different perspective from you. And because what we do is involved with the public interest, you really have to be persuasive. You really have to believe in what you're doing and be robust about it. And, and that takes quite uh, determination, but a resilience. And you have to think about long-term outcomes. It's not about short-term wins. It's quite what we're involved in has a real impact on the quality of people's lives. And we need to take the long-term perspective on it. So we need that broad range of skills. And an awful lot of that can't be learned. An awful lot about that is, um, is it will be learned beyond a classroom or will be learned beyond reading a law book. But um, I would say as working as a professional planner for 25 years or so, I think it's a really, really important profession. I think it's a really valuable profession and I don't think it's possibly valued as much as it could be. But I have had a great career working in planning and um, I have to say I've never experienced a day where I haven't learned something and we're different, uh, where I've come across something different. But ultimately, I think if you can work in an area where you think that you are achieving something or adding value, and if you can add value and improve the quality of people's lives, whether that is approving house extension for a disabled person or whether that is creating some huge urban plan, you know, regardless of what perspective it's coming from, it has the ability to improve the quality of people's lives. So I think that's a great opportunity to have. Um, so I think as planners, whilst I don't think often we're valued, I think we should always know our worth. Um, and we have a positive role to play and, and, and that we should appreciate that and take it seriously. So thank you. Thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. Um, I, I work on planning sustainability, so I've got two kind of more environmentally focused questions. One is, um, how does marine spatial planning fit in in the context of, of Northern Ireland? Um, and secondly, um, you talked about sustainability, but I guess I want to push you a little bit harder on, on actually the carbon reduction element of that. I hope I'm, I'm a bit ignorant on this, but I assume the Climate Change Act applies in Northern Ireland as well as the UK-wide act. Um, so how specifically are you planning for reductions in carbon emissions through, through the structures that you've outlined there? As, as mentioned, we were doing quite a lot of work in terms of environmental compliance, and that will be part, that's part of that, to make sure that we address climate change as well as our environmental responsibilities. So I think in terms of specific areas of responsibility for different things, and that's part of the problem. So in terms of climate change, we're doing quite a lot of work on flood risk assessments and on uh, coastal planning. Um, and that's in relation to climate change. But on the planning side, we're also doing quite a bit of work on climate change. And so what we need to try and do is bring, instead of people working independently, we need to try and find ways that we bring them together. So. Um, I, and individually, and our, each department has a huge responsibility also in terms of uh, carbon reduction, and we all have our own individual departments, um, uh, plans where we try to address climate change. So there's a whole range of uh, responsibilities and actions that are being taken across. In terms of spatial planning, spatial planning is the responsibility... Marine planning. Of, uh, marine planning. Mm -hmm. spatial, uh, marine planning is responsibility for... Um, Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs and they are just taking forward uh, their marine plan at the moment. I think that they um, are quite advanced in terms of their consultation arrangements for the marine plan. Um, but it's one of the challenges I think that we all face because we work, we are really trying since we have this new draft programme for government 
to look at the outcomes of what we're trying to achieve rather than look at the departmental responsibilities and that's one of the things that we're trying to bring all of it together. Okay. Yes. Uh, even in spite of Brexit, with all these sort of big infrastructure projects and uh, sort of um, th other things like that, can you imagine Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland actually coming much closer and working together in terms of planning? If you, you know, sharing common land and uh, ideally we'd probably be, you know, working together a lot more, mm. transport, stuff like that, as you said, water, electricity. Yeah, well, in some areas there are regulatory shared responsibilities. So there's a regulator for the electricity supply that's shared. The, uh, in terms of planning, we have a really good relationship and a close enough working relationship with colleagues in the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government in the Republic of Ireland. At a regional level, we would work quite closely with them because of obviously the infrastructural projects and in our regional development strategy there would be um, much more emphasis now on working with the south of Ireland than there would have been previously and as you'll understand a lot of that has a political dimension to it. Um, our former minister was very keen that we work very closely with the southern government in relation to regional planning and that was Sinn Féin Minister who had a particular interest in, in working on an all-island basis. But, you know, we, we work with that uh, in a political environment and a different, um, we adapt to whatever political circumstances we come across. In terms of uh, Brexit, I think that there's um, an, an increased imperative maybe to make sure that we work um, at a strategic and coordinated way. Uh, and, and we're trying to do that. We've just recently done a, you know, provided a consultation response to the Southern Ireland National Planning Framework. Yep. Um, it's interesting you know, the way you talk about collaboration, trying to use space making as the centre of that. And can you, is there any more detail you can give on how you think that could be achieved in terms of We published a really good document that you could read. It's called Living Places, it's award-winning document. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but Living Places, I suppose, was our attempt to try and broaden the debate about place shaping and to move beyond a much more kind of narrow, focused, land just approach to, to planning. Um, and I suppose we do have some good examples how we've introduced collaborative working. So we have a strategic design group, we have a ministerial advisory group, all about placemaking. And um, so we've tried to bring together practitioners and architects, urban designers, transportation planners, um, you know, uh, uh, and get them to work collabor and local government and central government and get them to work on a project. So we have a couple of projects that we're we're developing at the moment that is where we've tried to have this collaborative approach, try to adopt a much more, a much less car dominated approach to place, to how we move around our cities. And we have a few examples of that. But I would recommend uh, Living Places. It's an urban stewardship um, document really. And it's tried to highlight some of the work that's been going on that's been successful, but encourage an approach. When, obviously when you go to Belfast, um, you go to West Belfast, you see still walls separating communities. Um, and you mentioned that planning has a role to play in breaking down the barriers, which are literally physical in, the, in this mm -hmm. case, between, between communities. Um, and of course, the Good Fire Agreement contained this <coughs> commitment, didn't it, to spatial planning within it, mm -hmm. which I've never really understood mm -hmm. why. Um, so. In practical terms, what can planning do to, in that situation in, in, where you have sort of you know, separate communities living cheek by jowl with each other? What, what, what can planners do to alter that scenario? Well, I think there's some quite practical things that people can do. 
Planning, I think, is an awful lot to do with influencing people and you know trying to get people to have a broader perspective um, and understand the role that their your environment by creating a better and improved environment it ultimately improves your quality of life. So I think people quite get that, but they, if you can visually represent that to communities, so you might have had a peace wall. And in some cases, there's been a success where the peace wall has come down and they've built an urban, you know, garden. And so you have a share, you have a community that can understand the value of rather than a physical barrier that you have a shared space. It's not an easy, it's not an, an easy thing to do. And there's still a long way to go in terms of building a shared and united future. But the executive has a real commitment to building a shared and united future and it's part of uh, it's been part of the numerous agreements that we we have had. Mm. Sonia. We're developing both at the same time. So whenever we transferred the planning powers and whenever the local government restructured, we transferred planning powers, but we also introduced a new power, which was their community plan power. So the community plan, the community plans that they will do in terms of taking forward how they wish their community to grow, whether it's the economy or infrastructure or whatever it is. Um, is linked to actually their development plan. So there's a statutory link to try and make sure that both are aligned. So the council's vision for their area, which will be outlined really essentially in their community plan, will also work along with their local development plan. So there would be like a fit between the two, mm. not just working from the upper level to No, they're, the no they're, they're both done in tandem with each other, which I think is the right way to do that. But they had an opportunity to do that because they were doing it, 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 one wasn't in place when the other one was being done. They, uh, they were both a new power at the same time, so most of the councils have delivered them in tandem. And most of the councils, it's only two years since we transferred the power, so most of, the power, most of the, this work is ongoing. There are no development plans in place at the moment, and it'll probably take another couple of years before the development plans are in place. Um, the, led, the community plans, are also mostly at consultation stages. Mm -hmm. But it's been a great opportunity to engage communities because communities weren't engaged in those processes at all. So if you're engaging in the community plan and engage and there's an interest in relation to a particular economic activity in the development plan, they're all able to align and you build that momentum of engagement and have people interested and allow them to see things happen. Have you quantified the level of engagement, you know, has it gone up compared to what it was in the past? Or no, mm. we it, it seems to have gone up, but there's quite a lot of effort. There's more, much more effort mm. put into mm. engagement um, than there would have been previously. And I think because local government are delivering the engagement uh, rather than central government, it's less detached. Mm. So, so it feels as if there's an improved engagement. But we're going to do a review. We will start, I think, next year, early next year. Um, we'll do a full a review of how the levels of engage, a review of the system, how it's operating, and and part of that will be about the engagement levels, because we have an obligation to review the plan and legislation. I think every five years, so we'll start doing that review early next year. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, Susanna. I was just going to ask, how on earth did you manage to get your members, the elected members, trained up and ready to go 
in doing a sort of we struggle here in our system mm. and finally being the you know on the northern left for a long time and um, forgive me I should say I'm a, I'm a councillor but I'm sure it was quite a challenge to bring some of the councillors on board especially when there are the divides as well mm. within communities because I also find councillors have a very strong knowledge of the local area they're very good for engaging and helping the communities engage as well but mm. on the other hand getting them actually trained up to make planning decisions after seven years on a planning committee I still struggle and I'm learning every time I go to a meeting and I wonder how I've managed to do that in two years mm. I think it's because we had a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> the legislation was coming into place on the 1st of April. Well, I, I, well, it's hard, and I would say that there's still a bit of a way to go on that. You know, we still work really hard to understand our relationship with local government and to, under, and to try and understand how local government is effectively operating the system. So we still, we really, we work in that dynamic, and at the start of it, we were quite... Um, I'd say hands off. It was a huge change and we thought, right, we've given them an awful lot of support and we've tried to develop their capability and capacity. We'll now let them go with that for a while uh, and we'll support and we'll provide guidance, but we won't, um, we, we'll not interfere or intervene, you know, we'll try and let them get on with it. So we, that was kind of our approach at the start. Um, to more recently, we've been much more engaged in activities in various different councils. And um, I think it, it's hard because if you understood the way the councillors were engaged in the planning process in Northern Ireland before, it was their only ability to intervene was really to object to something. So if, we were, if something was being approved and a councillor was unhappy with it, they objected. Or, so it was in that kind of they were representing their local community through an objection process. Now it's a completely different role because they are the decision maker. So it's just the complete opposite of where they were. But I have to say, I, I was really impressed not only by the planners that transferred in their ability to adapt to that change and adapt to that different relationship with elected members, but um, also with the elected members' ability to, to take on those new responsibilities. Because it was a big ask, you know, they could be involved, as you will know, in um, difficult and contentious decisions in their local communities, and and they are the people now that are having to defend the decision, as opposed to the department defending the decision. Kwame. Yeah, I'm quite impressed with how far you've come on over the years, and I heard you talking about sustainability. I would like to know how far planning has really contributed to social sustainability. Uh, because often, when you talk of sustainability, that is the missing link. We talk about environment, we talk about economics, but we forget the dominant things like human life. And I would like to know how planning has enhanced social life. The ordinary man in the field, because often we are the marginalized majority, one or the other. Now, mm -hmm. we talk about engagement. I would like to know how you define engagement, because as far as I'm concerned, engaging with the local councillors does not necessarily mean that you are engaging with the people in the locality, because most of these councillors, you see them only during elections, when you leave your vote. Engagement to what level and sustainability? What about social development? How is planning contributing to social development? Because when I think of urban regeneration, for example, in my view, urban regeneration is leading to social cleansing. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I've taken got about half a dozen questions there, Kwame. So that, I'll just choose the answer. Yeah, what I want. yeah, yeah you, you select one and answer. Yeah. I think councillors are doing a great job. <laughs> the, uh, well, I suppose in terms of community engagement, if you look at where we were in Northern Ireland and central government taking planning decisions, 
and the disconnect there, we, are, we have come a huge way. So now we have elected members and our local councillors who are certainly much closer to their community than central government were. So we have huge, you know, I think that in itself is a big change and a much higher level of engagement. But we have tried, and I, I think it's, it's difficult. Community engagement in the planning process is all, always difficult. I remember doing a, one of my projects when I was at university about trying to and engage with communities, and that was because the local planning department were trying to engage with students to come up with some good ideas about engagement. But you, we, we have introduced statutory responsibilities on developers to make them engage with the communities, to make them engage with their communities, whether it's through a planning application or whether it's through it's a development plan. So we have tried to force their hand. We don't have a third party right of appeal, similar to here. Um, in the Republic of Ireland, there is a third party right of appeal, and we are continually becoming under a bit of pressure. Um, it's always underlying, you know, should there be a third right of appeal, and people think that the community um, are not don't have that level of engagement because there's no third party right of appeal. But I think we've tried as best we can to introduce a system that has much higher levels of engagement um, with communities and in a more positive way and at the right stage of the process. So rather than the communities being engaged at the very end of the process, now they're in what we attempt to do is have them engaged at the start of the process. And underlying, whilst we do our fundamental principle for uh, within our strategic plan and policy, it is about social, economic, and environmental. That's what the, the considerations are based on. So their social and economic and environmental have a common theme throughout all of our strategic policies. Okay, Jess. Partly goes back to the level of how people are trying to engage with the communities, you know, how effective some of it could be. Um, Northern Ireland is quite a small place as well, um, and so there's quite, because of our history as well, there's very strong communities. So sometimes it's, it can be quite easy to engage a community, particularly around themes. So I, I think it, even within the urban areas, and the larger urban areas, say for Belfast, and I'm from Derry, uh, within those areas, there's still very strong communities um, and a lot of um, uh, very kind of local issues. And it's very easy to engage, I think, the communities with whenever you're coming from a background like that. And that rural kind of environment that you described, that would be quite similar as well. Mm -hmm. um, to communities in a sense. All right. So mm -hmm. The spatial areas which are planning might not be the same as mm. the community. Mm. No, it's very hard. It's very hard. There, and there's, there's no getting away from the fact that there's a lot of, uh, you know, that we've come from a long history of a divided community. And I think planning has a role to continue to shape building a new and more united community. And I think you need to try and come up with shared things that interest both sides of the community. So whether it's education or a health facility, and rather than having two, which would have been traditionally what would happen, to try and understand that there's a benefit to a shared community. And I think it's probably maybe a generational thing. You know, it might take a couple. So the planning system is only two, the new system is only two years in place. It, I think it'll be a generational thing before we start to, to notice those changes in terms of uh, uh, divided communities and shared communities. Any other? Can we talk about the if you want to try to engage developers in the process, do you 
don't actually uh, impose any rules on Mm -hmm. and, and that's part of what we try to do to, by front loading the, the whole, you know development proposals that we have we have a pre-application um, consultations where the, the developers have to come in and engage with the department or the planning authority and also with the communities so that we try and build together um, you know the what what we believe collectively and influence collectively what we think is right in terms of the development proposal and how the broader impacts. So say we had uh, quite a significant development proposal for university extension in Belfast and part of that is about trying to get the communities involved, get the university involved and understand the interface between the university and the local community and the impact that that's going to have and, and how we can try and draw some social clauses into the university campus build to make sure that the local communities and society gain from that. So I'm not sure if that's the type of thing you're talking about, but... Yeah, I wonder how, the, how to what extent are developers willing to cooperate with you delivering the strategy mm. that you are highlighting mm. and that you are defining? Mm. I think uh, good developers are engaged in that process and will want to do it. Uh, for those that mightn't wish to do it so much, that's why we've had to introduce statutory requirements. If there's a statutory requirement to do it, they will, they'll have to do it. But if they can see the benefit from the statutory requirement, they're more inclined to want to do it. Loris? Yep. The, certainly this, the planning function as it's delivered now through local government I think is much more engaging with and a much improved relationship with local representatives and with local communities and view it in a different way from central government engaged and felt a responsibility to um, engage with local communities because I think there was just too big a disconnect. Um, the, the relationship between central and local government now, if you, can, if you understand where we came from, we, had, we transferred 400 staff to local government. So at one stage they would all have been my staff and I would have worked with all of them and would have known them all extremely well. Um, and all of them had only ever worked in central government and all of them had only ever worked in one department because that's where all of the planners in Northern Ireland worked. And so we transferred as a result of a political decision, although which I firmly believe was the right thing to do, that planning should be delivered by local government. But we transferred an awful lot of staff who might not necessarily ideally have wanted to leave. And we're trying at one stage to work for two masters. We're trying to work for the government, central government, and we're also trying to build relationships at local government. So they threw their weight, which they rightly should have, towards local government. And I think there's, there's a tension that we've had to manage that relationship because with staff that we let go and we wanted them to work for local government, um, but yet we, it took a while for, for that all to settle down. And I think, to be honest, that's still taking a while to settle down. And I think that's why the dynamics of uh, the relationships Part of it is because of that history. And it's really early days and we're asking elected members um, to take really difficult decisions. And 
you know, you're asking earlier how did we developed that capacity. We did an awful lot of training with them, and you know, they came and visited a lot of committees over here. But when they were doing all of that, we got the staff that would be working with them in the future to do all of that with them. So we were really, even though they were our staff at the time, we were really trying to get them to engage and develop good working relationships within local government. It was a hard thing to do. Mm. <laughs> really harsh. <laughs> but that, I, th I suppose I think that's part of what being a planner is about. It's about because whether you use your influence and skills in trying to persuade a developer this is the right thing to do, or a community, or whatever, or whether you're trying to explain to staff this is why planning needs to be delivered by local government. If you genuinely believe in what you do and it's the right thing to do, you can be quite persuasive and you need to be able to do that. Okay. Any final questions? I, I've got a question. Um, <laughs> we, um, we, we've entered this stage in, uh, in England now where we're creating these new city regional authorities with with metro mayors. Mm -hmm. So in order to have one of these authorities, you've got to have a metro mayor who will be directly elected. Uh, and what's noticeable is that many of these direct directly, er <laughs> directly elected mayors are being given uh, responsibility for spatial planning. And part, part of the inspiration for that is precisely that, you know, Northern Ireland has, uh, devolved Northern Ireland has spatial planning, air responsibilities, Wales does, Scotland does, London does. So the idea is that by creating these new structures, we will have a, um, a body to which we can devolve spatial planning uh, authority. And lurking there as well is the idea that by having directly elected politician in charge of all of this, we'll have a more accountable and more effective planning system. You're a devolved administration, but without a functioning government at the moment. So the question I'm interested in is, what difference does devolving political power to, to elected representatives at the Northern Ireland scale make to the planning process? The planning system is working. There's no politicians in charge at the moment, but you're carrying on with your work. Is, is the planning system doing a less effective job? And if you had a, an elected assembly with a minister from Sinn Féin or the DUP, would you be able to do more? What difference does that political authority make in your judgment? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe that we would be in a much better place if we had the political institutions operating because I work in an environment where I work for a minister and we take forward the policies and the legislation that are democratically elected politicians and ministers um, and how they represent the public and, and their, what they want to see having been elected by them. And, that, and that's how we take forward policy and how we take decisions. And we do all of that by providing really thorough and rigorous evidence and helping inform the decision. But it's politicians that take policy direction. So as a planner, you need to be able to really engage with politicians and understand how they work so that you can influence them in the best possible way so that you can help inform them, make good decisions. It's up, ultimately up to them what the decision might be. So say, for example, our role in terms of working collaboratively with the South of Ireland, we have a special collaboration framework which allows us to do that. But that's because we work in separate jurisdictions, but politically we have an agreement that we can do that. So I find it quite an uncomfortable place to be as a senior civil servant working in an environment where you don't have that political um, direction behind you and where we are taking decisions, not decisions that um, I would want to take in the absence of a minister. Uh, but we, have, we find ourselves in a position where we are doing things in the public interest and we, decisions have to be made. But it's, I believe that those decisions are better placed to be taken by a minister rather than a civil servant. Okay. Good, good civil service answer. <laughs> <laughs> good.
Turn the camera off now. <laughs> yes, yeah. Right. Well, what, what, what I um, well, I'd like to sort of uh, conclude shortly by uh, thanking Fiona for her presentation. But I'd like to uh, reaffirm my invitation for you to join us for a drink in the South Cloister. There'll be should be some wine and, and, and food there. Sorry, North Cloister. Okay. <laughs> did I say North? Cl did I say that? Uh -huh. <laughs> I've written something. I have written it. Yeah, North Cloister. Um, so please join us. Please, please join us for a drink, and then you can find out from Fiona what she really thinks about these <laughs> these questions. Um, so can I can I sort of conclude proceedings? Uh, for those of you who don't know where the North Cloister is, just follow the crowd. And um, uh, f uh, but can I conclude by uh, thanking again Fiona for making the journey uh, to come and speak to us this evening and for, for speaking in such a, uh, an informed and uh, candid way about uh, the life of a, of a chief planner. Um, and I think uh, for, for the students among us, I think in particular, there's been some sound career advice as well as insights mm -hmm. into uh, the politics of planning. So um, could we show our appreciation in the traditional manner?